In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Be seated. I read about a study that some psychologists did about how people make decisions. And in the study, they managed to somehow find a large sample of people who are making an important life decision. Maybe about a new job they were considering, or a major move, or whether or not to go back to school, something like that. And something about which they reported a certain amount of distress making the decision, because they could see the pros and cons of either side. So they divided the sample into two groups. One group, they had carefully go through the pros and cons of each aspect of the decision that they could make, listing them out and thinking about them very carefully and coming to a very rational and ordered decision. And then they went on their way. The other group, they invited to commit to putting their decision up to chance, that they would simply flip a coin and abide by whatever the coin decided. Several years later, they followed up with both groups to see which reported being happier with the decision that they had come to. Interestingly, the group that abided by the random flip of the coin reported being happier than the group that had carefully weighed their pros and cons and made their decision with great deliberation. What does this teach us? It teaches us, for one thing, that rational explanations and ways of making decisions are actually not what usually drives human behavior. This is a fact well known to marketers and to uh, economists and to people for generations that most people make decisions about what to buy or where to go to school or, or who to marry based on things that are sub-rational, based on things that are relational or intuitive or perhaps uh, just perceptual. This is true of how we understand theology as well, if you think about it. Our theology is actually faith seeking understanding. In other words, we have the experience of God, and then we try to make sense of it. The rational is often backfilling the relational or the intuitive. In fact, how we perceive things, though, has a great impact on how we decide uh, what we have done, whether it was good or bad. And it's interesting how that perception flavors then how we characterize God. Most people's images of God are shaped by their early family experiences, their, their childhood, but then it's colored by later experiences, both of, of God in their lives and also of the world as they encounter it. But what's interesting is that people's perceptions of God are often, I think we would consider them, distorted. It's just true that if you ask people about their images of God, often what they describe to you doesn't sound very much like God, at least not a God that we would worship and follow. Perception seems to be everything. Consider the story of the landowner. One of the big theological debates in interpreting this passage is whether the landowner in this parable is an allegory for God. You might know that uh, my predecessor uh, used to say that, the, uh, Andrew Sheldon used to say that uh, in these kind of parables, in these allegories, the first person mentioned is always God the Father. And there's other arguments for thinking this might be God as well. After all, this is one of Jesus' allegories about the end time. Isn't this about the landowner generously giving gifts to the people, us, and then judging them based on how well they had been stewards of those gifts? The generous and the sorry, the faithful are rewarded generously for their gifts. Well, maybe not. There's other problems with this parable being God the Father. For one thing, he's rather exploitative of his workers, his slaves in this passage, right? I mean, he, he makes them go off and do the work for him, and then he enjoys the benefits of their reward. Also, he's fairly cold-hearted in how he goes about it, and somewhat unreasonable with the third slave, and perhaps downright unjust. After all, his response to the third slave, who had simply buried the money, which, by the way, in that time would have been a perfectly rational way to store money where it would be safe, because they didn't have, you know, banks like we have now exactly. So it was disproportionate. It was, retrib uh, it was retributive justice. In other words, it was kind of just desserts, Old Testament, if I dare say that, style of justice here. Not very much what we want to usually associate with God. In fact, my God doesn't look very much like this stern landowner at all. My perception is rather different. So let's take another look at this parable a little bit closer. First of all, the first two slaves that go off with their gifts, they go off and they're able to get 100% return. And it doesn't tell us how long they had to do that, but that's quite an extraordinary feat in any time period. I mean, the economics of that. I mean, if you wanted to get 100% return on an investment of, say, 5% interest, that would take you 72 years divided by 5, which is, can somebody do the math real quick? Anyway, it's that's like 12 and a half years, something like that. Like it would take you more than a decade to earn 100% interest. 
But yet somehow they're able to do it in the comparatively short amount of time in the parable after some time. But when the third slave goes, comes back, he has acted quite differently. Rather than going out and being a sort of venture capitalist in ancient Palestine, he has held on to the money. And he gives his reason. He says, I know that you are a hard man. A harsh man, actually, in this translation. He says, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. This is the first negative association with the landowner in this parable. The only way that we characterize the landowner as being harsh is because of what this slave does and, and, and because of how uh, the, uh, the landowner responds. In fact, all the, res- the landowner does in response to this man's caution, his fear-driven, fear-driven caution, is he simply judges him by his own words, judges him as harshly as he was afraid of being judged. In other words, the third slave's perception becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if perception is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and if how we imagine God matters, then how do we shape those perceptions? I said before that they're often formulated by early childhood experiences and by our later experiences of the world and of God and so on. But I want to dig a slightly deeper into that and say that we can shape those perceptions to a certain degree. We shape them by deciding where we're going to look to see God, what we're going to pay attention to and claim is attributes of God or God at work in the world. We have some ways of doing that. We have, of course, scripture. We have the testimony of others who've experienced God in their lives. But that can be confusing because people don't always have an accurate perception of where God has been at work, as I said before. But there's another way, a still more excellent way. As I said, I think that primarily people make their decisions based on emotional or relational reasons. If that's true, then we should look for a relationship or an emotion to make our perceptions of God formulate in our minds. And that relationship, beloved, is none other than that we have with Jesus. In other words, in Jesus, in the things that he did, in the teachings that he gave us, in the continuing way that he's in our lives, the presence that we feel close to him sometimes, that's how we know what love is. And that's the perception that we should look to to shape how we know who God is. So that God is not the stern and harsh taskmaster whose justice is arbitrary and retributive and, and disproportionate and harsh, It's not that at all. When we look at Jesus to form who we think God is, we see God as loving, as generous, as one who invites us into his joy, as the landowner invites the first two slaves into his joy. Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Think about that. These were slaves, or at least servants, depending on how you want to translate the Greek. But they were certainly not equal to this man who had such extraordinary wealth that he thought of nothing of gambling with many talents. And talents, by the way, one talent is equivalent to 15 years' wages for a regular day laborer. That's a staggering sum of money. And he's able to risk all of that for these slaves, these servants. And his response when they have done well with it is to bless them. And to make them almost equal to himself, enter into the joy of your master. Imagine. That is what our God invites us into. That is the kind of love that Jesus has for us as he invites us to come into his joy with his Father in heaven. Amen. So now as I customarily do, I'll open this up a bit if people have something to share in response.